Chapter 10. Engine Maintenance and Operation. Reciprocating Engine Overhaul. Both maintenance and complete engine overhauls are performed normally at specified intervals. This interval is usually governed by the number of hours the power plant has been in operation. The actual overhaul period for a specific engine is generally determined by the manufacturer's recommendations. Each engine manufacturer sets a total time in service when the engine should be removed from service and overhauled. Depending upon how the engine is used in service, the overhaul time can be mandatory. The overhaul time is listed in hours and is referred to as time before overhaul TPO. For example, if an engine had a life of 2,000 hours and it operated 500 hours, it would have a TPO of 1,500 hours. Tests and experience have shown that operation beyond this period of time could result in certain parts being worn beyond their safe limits. For an overhauled engine, to be as airworthy as a new one, worn parts, as well as damaged parts, must be detected and replaced during overhaul. The only way to detect all unairworthy parts is to perform a thorough and complete overhaul process while the engine is disassembled. The major purpose of overhaul is to inspect, repair, and replace worn engine parts. 10-1 A complete overhaul process includes the following 10 steps. Receiving inspection, disassembly, visual inspection, cleaning, structural inspection, non-destructive testing and DT inspection, dimensional inspection, repair and replacement, reassembly, and testing and break-in. The inspection phases are the most precise and the most important phases of the overhaul. Inspection cannot be slighted or performed in a careless or incomplete manner. It is always recommended that complete records be made of the inspection process and kept with the engine records. Each engine manufacturer provides very specific tolerances to which the engine parts must conform and provides general instructions to aid in determining the airworthiness of the part. However, in many cases, the final determination must be made by the technician. Although the determination must be made, if the part is serviceable, repairable, or should be rejected, the technician should follow the manufacturer's manuals and information. When dimensional tolerances are concerned, the manufacturer publishes a new minimum and serviceable dimension for all critical component parts. Knowledge of the operating principles, strength, and stresses applied to a part is essential in making decisions regarding visible wear. When the power plant technician signs the release for the return to service for an overhauled engine, this certifies that the complete overhaul process has been performed using methods, techniques, and practices acceptable to the Federal Aviation Administration FAA Administrator. Top Overhaul Reciprocating piston aircraft engines can be repaired by a top overhaul. This means an overhaul of those parts on top of the crankcase without completely dismantling the engine. It includes removal of the units i.e., exhaust collectors, ignition harness, intake pipes necessary to remove the cylinders. The actual top overhaul consists of reconditioning the engine cylinders by replacing or reconditioning the piston and piston rings, and reconditioning or plating the cylinder wall and valve operating mechanism, including valve guides if needed. A top overhaul is a little misleading, because it is really an engine repair procedure and not a real overhaul as described earlier. Usually at this time, the accessories require no attention other than that normally required during ordinary maintenance functions. This repair is generally due to valves or piston rings wearing prematurely. Many stress that if an engine requires this much dismantling, it should be completely disassembled and receive a major overhaul. Major overhaul and major repairs. Major overhaul consists of the complete reconditioning of the power plant. A reciprocating engine would require that the crankcase be disassembled per the FAA. A major overhaul is not generally a major repair. A certified power plant rated. Technician can perform or supervise a major overhaul of an engine if it is not equipped with an internal supercharger or has a propeller reduction system other than spur type gears. At regular intervals, an engine should be completely dismantled, thoroughly cleaned, and inspected. Each part should be overhauled in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions and tolerances for the engine involved. At this time all accessories are removed, overhauled, and tested. Again, instructions from the manufacturer of the accessory concerned should be followed. General overhaul procedures. Because of the continued changes and the many different types of engines in use, it is not possible to treat the specific overhaul of each engine in this text. However, there are various overhaul practices and instructions of a non-specific nature that apply to all makes and models of engines. Any engine to be overhauled completely should receive a runout check of its crankshaft or propeller shaft as a first step. Any question concerning crankshaft or propeller shaft replacement is resolved at this time, since a shaft whose runout is beyond limits must be replaced. Receiving inspection. The receiving inspection consists of determining the general condition of the total engine as received, along with an inventory of the engine's components. The accessory information should be recorded, such as model and serial numbers, and the accessories should be sent to overhaul if needed. The overhaul records should be organized, and the appropriate manuals obtained and reviewed along with a review of the engine's history logbooks. The engine service bulletins, 
airworthiness directives, and type certificate compliance should be checked. The exterior of the engine should be cleaned after mounting it on an overhaul stand. Figure 10-1. Disassembly. As visual inspection immediately follows disassembly, all individual parts should be laid out in an orderly manner on the workbench as they are removed. To guard against damage and to prevent loss, suitable containers should be available in which to place small parts nuts, bolts, head, during the disassembly operation. Other practices to observe during disassembly include 1. Drain the engine oil sumps and remove the oil filter. Drain the oil into a suitable container, strain it through a clean cloth. Check the oil and the cloth for metal particles. And 2. Figure 10-1. Engine mounted on an overhaul stand. 2. Dispose of all safety devices safety wire, hotter pins, egg, as they are removed. Never use them a second time. Always replace with new safety devices. 3. All loose studs and looser damaged fittings should be carefully tacked to prevent being overlooked during inspection. 4. Always use the proper tool for the job. Use sockets and hocks and wrenches wherever possible. If special tools are required, use them rather than improvising. Inspection process. The inspection of engine parts during overhaul is divided into three categories. 1. Visual 2. Structural and DT3. Dimensional. Many defects on the engine components can be detected visually, and the determination of airworthiness can be made at this time. If, by visual inspection, the component is determined to be unairworthy, the part is rejected, and no further inspection or repair is required. Structural failures can be determined by several different methods. Magnetic parts can readily be examined by the magnetic particle method. Other methods, such as dye penetrate, eddy current, ultrasound, and x-ray, can also be used. The first two methods are aimed at determining structural failures in the parts, while the last method deals with the size and shape of each part. By using very accurate measuring equipment, each engine component can be dimensionally evaluated and compared to service limits and standards tolerances set by the manufacturer. Visual inspection. Visual inspection should precede all other inspection procedures. Parts should not be cleaned before a preliminary visual inspection, since indications of a failure may often be detected from the residual deposits of metallic particles in some recesses in the engine. Several terms are used to describe defects detected in engine parts during inspection. Some of the more common terms and definitions are 1. Abrasion An area of roughened scratches or marks usually caused by foreign matter between moving parts or surfaces. 2. Riddling one or more indentations on bearing races, usually caused by high static loads or application of force during installation or removal. Indentations are rounded or spherical due to the impression left by the contacting balls or rollers of the bearing. 3. Burning surface damage due to excessive heat. It is usually caused by improper fit, defective lubrication, or over temperature operation. 4. Burnishing polishing of one surface by sliding contact with a smooth, harder surface. Usually no displacement nor removal of metal. 5. For a sharper roughened projection of metal usually resulting from machine processing. 6. Shaping a condition caused by a rubbing action between two parts under light pressure that results in wear. 7. Shipping breaking away of pieces of material that is usually caused by excessive stress concentration or careless handling. 8. Corrosion loss of metal by a chemical or electrochemical action. The corrosion products are easily removed by mechanical means. Iron rust is an example of corrosion. 9. Crack a partial separation of material usually caused by vibration, overloading, internal stresses, defective assembly, or fatigue. Depth may be a few thousandths to the full thickness of the piece. 10. Hug loss of metal, usually to an appreciable depth over a relatively long and narrow area, by mechanical means, as would occur with the use of a saw blade, chisel, or sharp-edged stone striking a glancing blow. 11. Dent a small, rounded depression in a surface usually caused by the part being struck with a rounded object. 10. 3. 12. Erosion loss of metal from the surface by mechanical action of foreign objects, such as grit or fine sand. The eroded area is rough, and may be lined in the direction that the foreign material moved relative to the surface. 13. Flaking the breaking loose of small pieces of metal or coated surfaces, that is usually caused by defective plating or excessive loading. 14. Threading a condition of surface erosion caused by minute movement between two parts usually clamped together with considerable unit pressure. 15. Calling a severe condition of chafing or fretting in which a transfer of metal from one part to another occurs. It is usually caused by a slight movement of mated parts, having limited relative motion, and under high loads. 16. Gouging a furrowing condition in which a displacement of metal has occurred a torn effect. It is usually caused by a piece of metal, or foreign material, between close moving parts. 17. Proving a recess, or channel, with rounded and smooth edges usually caused by faulty alignment of parts. 18. Inclusion presence of foreign or extraneous material entirely within a portion of metal. 
Such material is introduced during the manufacture of rod, R, or tubing by rolling or forging. 19. Nick a sharp-sided gouge or depression with a V-shaped bottom, and is generally the result of careless handling of tools and parts. 20. Eating a series of blunt depressions in a surface. 21. Pick up or scuffing a buildup, or rolling of metal from one area to another, and is usually caused by insufficient lubrication, clearances, or foreign matter. 22. Hitting small hollows of irregular shape in the surface, usually caused by corrosion or minute mechanical chipping of surfaces. 23. Scoring a series of deep scratches caused by foreign particles between moving parts, or careless assembly or disassembly techniques. 24. Scratches shallow, thin lines or marks, varying in degree of depth and width, caused by presence of fine foreign particles during operation or contact with other parts during handling. 25. Stain a change in color, locally, causing a noticeably different appearance from the surrounding area. 26. Setting a displacement of material beyond the normal contour or surface a local bulge or bump. Usually indicates no metal loss. Examine all gears for evidence of pitting or excessive wear. These conditions are of particular importance when they occur on the teeth. Deep pit marks in this area are sufficient cause to reject the gear. Bearing surfaces of all gears should be free from deep scratches. However, minor abrasions usually can be dressed out with a fine abrasive cloth. All bearing surfaces should be examined for scores, galling, and wear. Considerable scratching and light scoring of aluminum bearing surfaces in the engine do no harm and should not be considered a reason for rejecting the part, provided it falls within the clearances set forth in the table of limits in the engine manufacturer's overhaul manual. Even though the part comes within the specific clearance limits, it is not satisfactory for reassembly in the engine unless inspection shows the part to be free from other serious defects. All bearings should be inspected visually and by feel for roughness, flat spots on balls, flaking or pitting of races, or scoring on the outside of races. All journals should be checked for galling, scores, misalignment, or out of round condition. Shafts, pins, ep, should be checked for straightness. This may be done, in most cases, by using V-blocks and a dial indicator. Pitted surfaces in highly stressed areas, resulting from corrosion, can cause ultimate failure of the part. The following areas should be examined carefully for evidence of such corrosion. 1. Interior surfaces of piston pins. 2. The fillets at the edges of crankshaft main and crank pin journal surfaces. 3. Thrust bearing races. If pitting exists on any of the surfaces mentioned, to the extent that it cannot be removed by polishing with crocus cloth or other mild abrasive, the part usually must be rejected. Parts, such as threaded fasteners or plugs, should be inspected to determine the condition of the threads. Badly worn or mutilated threads cannot be tolerated, the parts should be rejected. However, small defects, such as slight nicks or burrs, may be dressed out with a small file, fine abrasive cloth, or stone. If the part appears to be distorted, badly galled, mutilated by over-tightening, or from the use of improper tools, replace it with a new one. Cylinder head. Inspect the cylinder head for internal and external cracks. Use a bright light to inspect for cracks, and investigate any suspicious areas with a magnifying glass or microscope. Carbon deposits must be cleaned from the inside of the head for head, and paint must be removed from the outside for this inspection. Exterior cracks show up on the head fins, where they have been damaged by tools or contact with other parts, because of careless handling. Cracks near the edge of the fins are not dangerous, if the portion of the fin is removed and contoured properly. Cracks at the base of the fin are a reason for rejecting the cylinder. Cracks may also occur on the rocker box or in the rocker bosses. Interior cracks almost always radiate from the valve seat bosses or the spark plug bushing boss. These cracks are usually caused by improper installation of the seats or bushings. They may extend completely from one boss to the other. Inspect the cylinder walls for rust, pitting, or scores. Mild damage of this sort can be removed when the cylinders are deglazed. With more extensive damage, the cylinder has to be recrowned or owned. If the damage is too deep to be removed by either of these methods, the cylinder usually will have to be rejected. Most engine manufacturers, or engine overhaul repair stations, have an exchange service on cylinders with damaged barrels, piston, valve train, and piston pin. When applicable, check for flatness of the piston head using a straightage and thickness gauge. Figure 10-2, if a depression is found, check for cracks on the inside of the piston. A depression in the top of the piston usually means that detonation has occurred within the cylinder. Inspect the exterior of the piston for scores and scratches. Scores on the top ring land are not cause for rejection, unless they are excessively deep. Deep scores on the side of the piston are usually a reason for rejection. Examine the piston for cracked skirts, broken ring lands, and scored piston pin holes. Do not mistake casting marks or laps for a crack. During major overhaul, most pistons are generally replaced, as it requires more labor to clean and inspect the piston than it costs to replace it. Check warpage with thickness gauge. Surface plate with hole board for cylinder skirtage. Figure 10-2. 
a method for checking cylinder flames warpage. Examine the valve visually for physical damage and damage from burning or corrosion. Do not reuse valves that indicate damage of this nature. Using a magnifying glass, examine the valve in the stem area and the tip for evidence of cracks, nicks, or other indications of damage. This type of damage seriously weakens the valve, making it susceptible to failure. If superficial nicks and scratches on the valve indicate that it might be cracked, inspect it using a structural inspection method described later. Examine the valve springs for cracks, rust, broken ends, and compression. Cracks can be located by visual inspection or the magnetic particle method. Inspect the rocker shaft bosses for scoring, cracks, oversize, or out of roundness. Scoring is generally caused by the rocker shaft turning in the bosses, which means either the shaft was too loose in the bosses, or a rocker arm was too tight on the shaft. Inspect the rocker arm bushing for correct size, by sliding the shaft into the bushings, to check for proper clearance between the shaft and the bushing. This clearance is also dimensionally checked during the dimensional inspection, to confirm the proper clearance. Often, the bushings are scored, because of mishandling during disassembly. Check to see, that the oil poles line up. At least 50% of the hole in the bushing, should align with the hole in the rocker arm. On engines that use a bearing, rather than a bushing, inspect the bearing to make certain it has not been turning in the rocker arm boss. Also, inspect the bearing to determine its serviceability. Inspect the valve rockers for cracks and worn, pitted, or scored tips. See that all oil passages are free from obstructions. Inspect all the studs on the cylinder head for looseness, straightness, damaged threads, and proper length. Slightly damaged threads may be chased with the proper tie. The length of the stud should be correct within plus or minus 132.03125 inch to allow for proper installation of safety devices. Crankshaft and connecting rods. Carefully inspect all surfaces of the crankshaft for cracks. Check the bearing surfaces for evidence of galling, scoring, or other damage. When the shaft is equipped with oil transfer tubes, check them for tightness. Visual inspection of connecting rods should be done with the aid of a magnifying glass or bench microscope. A rod that is obviously bent or twisted should be rejected without further inspection. Inspect all surfaces of the connecting rods for cracks, erosion, pitting, galling, or other damage. Galling is caused by a slight amount of movement between the surfaces of the bearing insert and the connecting rod during periods of high loading, such as that produced during over. And 5. Speed or excessive manifold pressure operation. The visual evidence produced by galling appears as if particles from one contacting surface had welded to the other. Evidence of any galling is sufficient reason for rejecting the complete rod assembly. Galling is a distortion in the metal and is comparable to corrosion in the manner in which it weakens the metallic structure of the connecting rods. Cleaning. After visually inspecting engine recesses for deposits of metal particles, it is important to clean all engine parts thoroughly to facilitate further inspection. Two processes for cleaning engine parts are 1. Decreasing to remove dirt and sludge soft carbon. 2. The removal of hard carbon deposits by decarbonizing brushing or scraping, and grit blasting. Decreasing. Decreasing can be done by immersing or spraying the part in a suitable commercial solvent. Figure 10 3 extreme care must be used if any water mixed decreasing solutions containing caustic compounds or soap are used. Such compounds, in addition to being potentially corrosive to aluminum and magnesium, may become impregnated in the pores of the metal and cause oil foaming when the engine is returned to service. Therefore, when using water mixed solutions, it is imperative that the parts be rinsed thoroughly and completely in clear boiling water after decreasing. Regardless of the method and type of solution used, odor spray all parts with lubricating oil immediately after cleaning to prevent corrosion. Removing hard carbon. While the decreasing solution removes dirt, grease, and soft carbon, deposits of hard carbon almost invariably remain on many interior surfaces. To remove these deposits, they must first be loosened by immersion in a tank containing a decarbonizing solution usually heated. A great variety of commercial decarbonizing agents are available. Decarbonizers, like the decreasing solutions previously mentioned, fall generally into two categories, water-soluble and hydrocarbons. The same caution concerning the use of water-soluble decreasers is applicable to water-soluble decarbonizers. Caution. When using a decarbonizing solution on magnesium castings, avoid immersing steel and magnesium parts in the same decarbonizing tank, as this practice often results in damage to the magnesium parts from corrosion. Decarbonizing will usually loosen most of the hard carbon deposits remaining after decreasing. However, the complete removal of all hard carbon generally requires brushing, scraping, or grit blasting. In all of these operations, be careful to avoid damaging the machine surfaces. In particular, wire brushes and metal scrapers must never be used on any bearing or contact surface. Follow the manufacturer's recommendations when gritlisting parts for the abrasive material being used. Sand, rice, baked wheat, plastic pellets, glass beads, or crushed walnut shells are examples of abrasive substances that are used for gritlisting parts. 
Print lasting machine is shown in figure 10 4. All machine surfaces must be masked properly and adequately, and all openings tightly plugged before blasting. One exception to this is the valve seats, which may be left unprotected when blasting the cylinder head combustion chamber. It is often advantageous to grit blast the seats, since this will cut the glaze which tends to form particularly on the exhaust valve seat, thus facilitating subsequent valve seat reconditioning. Piston ring grooves may be grit blasted if necessary, however, extreme caution must be used to. Figure 10-3. Typical solvent decreasing tank. Figure 10-4. Grit blasting machine. 10-6. Avoid the removal of metal from the bottom and sides of the grooves. When grit blasting housings, plug all drilled oil passages with rubber plugs or other suitable material to prevent the entrance of foreign matter. The decarbonizing solution will generally remove most of the enamel on exterior surfaces. All remaining enamel should be removed by grit blasting, particularly in the crevices between cylinder cooling fins. At the conclusion of cleaning operations, rinse the parted petroleum solvent, dry and remove any loose particles of carbon or other foreign matter by air blasting, and apply a liberal coating of preservative oil to all surfaces. Magnesium parts should be cleaned thoroughly with a dichromate treatment prior to painting. This treatment consists of cleaning all traces of grease and oil from the part by using a neutral, non-corrosive decreasing medium followed by a rinse, after which the part is immersed for at least 45 minutes in a hot dichromate solution 3 fourths of a pound of sodium dichromate to 1 gallon of water at 180 degrees F to 200 degrees F. Then the part should be washed thoroughly in cold running water, dipped in hot water, and dried in an air blast. Immediately thereafter, the part should be painted with a prime coated engine enamel in the same manner as that suggested for aluminum parts. Some older engines used sludge chambers in the crankshafts, which were manufactured with hollow crank pins that serve as sludge removers. The sludge chambers require inspection and cleaning and overhaul. Sludge chambers are formed by means of spool-shaped tubes pressed into the hollow crank pins, or by plugs pressed into each end of the crank pin. If an engine has a sludge chamber or tubes, they must be removed for cleaning and overhaul. If these are not removed, accumulated sludge loosened during cleaning may clog the crankshaft oil passages and cause subsequent bearing failures. If the sludge chambers are formed by means of tubes pressed into the hollow crank pins, make certain they are reinstalled correctly to avoid covering the ends of the oil passages. Due to improved oils, sludge chambers are no longer used with modern engines. Structural inspection. One of the best methods to double check your visual inspection findings is to supplement them with one of the forms of non-destructive testing, such as magnetic particle inspect, dye penetrate inspection, eddy current, ultrasound, and x-ray. Defects in non-magnetic parts aluminum parts can be found by all these methods, except for magnetic particle inspect, which is used for magnetic or ferrous material steel. Dye penetrant inspection. Dye penetrant inspection is a non-destructive test for defects open to the surface in parts made of any non-porous material. It is used with equal success on such metals as aluminum, magnesium, brass, copper, cast iron, stainless steel, and titanium. Dye penetrant inspection uses a penetrating liquid that enters a surface opening and remains there, making it clearly visible to the inspector. It calls for visual examination of the part after it has been processed, increasing the visibility of the defect so that it can be detected. Visibility of the penetrating material is increased by the addition of one of two types of dye, visible or fluorescent. When using a fluorescent dye, the inspection is accomplished using an ultraviolet UV light source black light. The steps for performing a dye penetrant inspection are 1. Thorough cleaning of the metal surface. 2. Applying penetrant. 3. Removing penetrant with remover emulsifier or cleaner. 4. Drying the part. 5. Applying the developer. 6. Inspecting and interpreting results. Eddy current inspection. Eddy currents are composed of free electrons under the influence of an induced electromagnetic field and are made to drift through metal. Different meter readings are seen when the same metal is in different hardness states. Readings in the affected area are compared with identical materials in known unaffected areas for comparison. A difference in readings indicates a difference in the hardness state of the affected area. Eddy current inspection can frequently be performed without removing the surface coatings, such as primer, paint, and anodized films. It can be effective in detecting surface and subsurface corrosion, hot and heat treat condition. Ultrasonic inspection. Ultrasonic detection equipment makes it possible to locate defects in all types of materials. There are three basic ultrasonic inspection methods. 1. Pulse echo. 2. Through transmission. 3. Resonance. Pulse echo. Flaws are detected by measuring the amplitude of signals reflected and the time required for these signals to travel between specific surfaces and the discontinuity. 10-7. Through transmission. Through transmission inspection uses two transducers, one to generate the pulse and another placed on the opposite surface to receive it. A disruption in the sound path indicates a flaw and is displayed on the instrument screen. Through transmission is less sensitive to small defects than the pulse echo method. Resonance. 
This system differs from the pulse echo method, in that the frequency of transmission may be continuously varied. The resonance method is principally used for thickness measurements, when the two sides of the material being tested are smooth and parallel, and the backside is inaccessible. The point at which the frequency matches the resonance point of the material being tested is the thickness determining factor. Magnetic particle inspection. Magnetic particle inspection is a method of detecting invisible cracks and other defects in ferromagnetic materials, such as iron and steel. It is not applicable to non-magnetic materials. The inspection process consists of magnetizing the part, and then applying ferromagnetic particles to the surface area to be inspected. The ferromagnetic particles indicating medium may be held in suspension in a liquid that is flushed over the part. The part may be immersed in the suspension liquid, or the particles, in dry powder form, may be dusted over the surface of the part. The wet process is more commonly used in the inspection of aircraft parts. If a discontinuity is present, the magnetic lines of force are disturbed, and opposite poles exist on either side of the discontinuity. The magnetized particles form a pattern in the magnetic field between the opposite poles. This pattern, known as an indication, assumes the approximate shape of the surface projection of the discontinuity. A discontinuity may be defined as an interruption in the normal physical structure or configuration of a part. X-ray. X-rays can penetrate material and disclose discontinuities through the metal or non-metal components, making it an excellent inspection process when needed to determine the structural integrity of an engine component. The penetrating radiation is projected through the part to be inspected and produces an invisible or latent image in the film. When processed, the film becomes a radiograph or shadow picture of the object. This inspection medium, as a portable unit, provides a fast and reliable means for checking the integrity of engine components. Additional and more thorough information on NDT inspection is covered in detail in the General Aviation Maintenance Technician Handbook FAA HA8330. Dimensional Inspection The dimensional inspection is used to assure that the engine's component parts and clearances meet the manufacturer's specifications. These specs are listed in a table of limits, which lists serviceable limits and the manufacturer's new part maximum and minimum dimensions. Many measuring tools are used to perform the dimensional inspection of the engine. Some examples of these devices are discussed as the procedure for measuring the engine's components for dimensional inspection is explained in the following paragraphs. Cylinder barrel. Inspect the cylinder barrel for wear, using a cylinder bore gauge figure 10.5, a telescopic gauge, and micrometer or an inside micrometer. Dimensional inspection of the barrel consists of the following measurements. 1. Maximum taper of cylinder walls. 2. Maximum out of roundness. 3. Bore diameter. 4. Step. 5 fit between piston skirt and cylinder. All measurements involving cylinder barrel diameters must be taken at a minimum of two positions 90 degrees apart in the particular plane being measured. It may be necessary to take more than two measurements to determine the maximum wear. Taper of the cylinder walls is the difference between the diameter of the cylinder barrel at the bottom and the diameter at the top. The cylinder is usually worn larger at the top than at the bottom. This taper is caused by the natural wear pattern. At the top of the stroke, the piston is subjected to greater heat and pressure and more erosive environment than at the bottom of the stroke. Also, there is greater freedom of movement at the top of the stroke. Under these conditions, the piston, figure 10-5, a cylinder bore gauge, 10-8, wears the cylinder wall more at the top of the cylinder. In most cases, the taper ends with a ridge that must be removed during overhaul. Figure 10-6, where cylinders are built with an intentional choke, measurement of taper becomes more complicated. Cylinder choke is where the top of the cylinder has been made with the very top diameter of the cylinder smaller to compensate for wear and expansion during operation. It is necessary to know exactly how the size indicates wear or taper. Taper can be measured in any cylinder by a cylinder dial gauge as long as there is not a sharp step. The dial gauge tends to ride upon the step and causes inaccurate readings at the top of the cylinder. The measurement for out of roundness is usually taken at the top of the cylinder. However, a reading should also be taken at the skirt of the cylinder to detect dents or bends caused by careless handling. A step, or ridge, is formed in the cylinder by the wearing action of the piston rings. Figure 10-6 The greatest wear is at the top of the ring travel limit. The ridge that results is likely to cause damage to the rings or piston. If the step exceeds tolerances, it should be removed by grinding the cylinder over size, or it should be blended by hand stoning to break the sharp edge. A step also may be found where the bottom ring reaches the lowest travel. This step is rarely found to be excessive, but it should be checked. Check the cylinder flange for warpage by placing the cylinder on a suitable jig. Check to see that the flange contacts the jig all the way around. The amount of warpage can be checked by using a thickness gauge. Figure 10 to a cylinder whose flange is warped beyond the limits should be rejected. Valves and valve springs. The locations for checking run out and edge thickness of the valves are shown in figure 10-7. Measure the edge thickness of valve heads. 
if, after rebasing, the edge thickness is less than the limit specified by the manufacturer, the valve must not be reused. The edge thickness can be measured with sufficient accuracy by a dial indicator and a surface plate. Out of roundness is usually caused by a stuck valve. If a valve sticks, the rocker shaft tends to work up and down when the valve offers excessive resistance to opening. Inspect for out of roundness and oversize using a telescopic gauge and a micrometer. Inspect the valve for stretch and wear using a micrometer or a valve radius as gauge. Figure 10 8. If a micrometer is used, stretch is found as a smaller diameter of the valve stem near the neck of the valve. Measure the diameter of the valve stem and check the fit of the valve in its guide. Compression is tested with a valve spring compression tester. Figure 10 9. The spring is compressed until its total height is that specified by the manufacturer. The dial on the tester should indicate the pressure in pounds required to compress the spring to the specified height. This must be within the pressure limits established by the manufacturer. Ridge worn atop of ring travel. Original cylinder wall. Ridge removed by grinding. Figure 10 6. Ridge or step formed in an engine cylinder. Ridge removed by hand stoning. 10 9. Face of valve must run through with stem within 0.0015 inch. Valve face. Do not include when measuring thickness A. A. Figure 10 7. Valve showing locations for checking run out and section for measuring edge thickness. Figure 10 9. Valve spring compression tester. Figure 10 8. Checking valve stretch with a manufacturer's gauge. Inspect the shaft's diameter for correct size with a micrometer. Rocker shafts are often found to be scored and burned because of excessive turning in the cylinder head. Also, there may be some pickup on the shaft rods from the rocker pushing transfer to the steel shaft. Generally, this is caused by overheating and too little clearance between shaft and bushing. The clearance between the shaft and the bushing is most important. Crankshaft. Use extreme care in inspecting and checking the crankshaft for straightness. Place the crankshaft and V-blocks, supported at the location specified in the applicable engine overhaul manual, as in figure 1010. Using a surface plate and a dial, indicator, measure the shaft runout. If the total indicator reading exceeds the dimensions given in the manufacturer's table of limits, the shaft must not be reused. A bent crankshaft should not be straightened. Any attempt to do so results in rupture of the nitrided surface of the bearing journals, a condition that causes eventual failure of the crankshaft. Measure the outside diameter of the crankshaft main and rod bearing journals using a micrometer. Figure 10 11 internal measurements can be made by using telescope engages, and then measuring the telescope engage with a micrometer. Figure 10 12 compare the resulting measurements with those in the table of limits. Checking alignment. Check bushings that have been replaced to determine if the bushing and rod bores are square and parallel to each other. The alignment of a connecting rod can be checked several ways. One method requires a push fit arbor for each end of the connecting rod, a surface plate, and two parallel blocks of equal height. 10 10. Figure 10 10. Check and crankshaft runout. To measure rod squareness, or twist, insert the arbors into the rod bores. Figure 10 13. Place the parallel blocks on the surface plate. Place the ends of the arbors on the parallel blocks. Using a thickness gauge, check the clearance at the points where the arbors rest on the blocks. This clearance, divided by the separation of the blocks in inches, gives the twist per inch of length. To determine bushing or bearing parallelism convergence, insert the arbors in the rod bores. Measure the distance between the arbors on each side of the connecting rod at points that are equidistant from the rod centerline. For exact parallelism, the distances checked on both sides should be the same. Consult the manufacturer's table of limits for the amount of misalignment permitted. The preceding operations are typical of those used for most reciprocating engines and are included to introduce some of the operations involved in engine overhaul. It would be impractical to list all the steps involved in the overhaul of an engine. It should be understood that there are other operations and inspections that must be performed. For exact information regarding a specific engine model, consult the manufacturer's overhaul manual. Repair and replacement. The engine components that have failed inspection or are unrepairable should have been discarded. The component parts that need repair and replacement are now given the attention required. The replacement component's new parts are organized and laid out for reassembly. Figure 10 11. A micrometer. Parallel blocks. Figure 10 12. Telescope engages and micrometer combination. Figure 10 13. Check and connecting rod squareness. 10 11. Minor damage to engine parts, such as burrs, nicks, scratches, scoring, or galling, should be removed with a fine oil stone, focus cloth, or any similar abrasive substance. Following any repairs of this type, the part should be cleaned carefully to be certain that all abrasive has been removed, and then check with its mating part to assure that the clearances are not excessive. Flanged surfaces that are bent, warped, or nicked can be repaired by lapping to a true surface on the surface plate. Again, the part should be cleaned to be certain that all abrasive has been removed. Defective threads can sometimes be repaired with a suitable dye or tap. 
Small nits can be satisfactorily removed with Swiss pattern files or small, etched stones. Pipe threads should not be tapped deeper to clean them, because this practice results in an oversized tapped hole. If galling or scratches are removed from a bearing surface of a journal, it should be buffed to a high polished finish. In general, welding of highly stressed engine parts can be accomplished only when approved by the manufacturer. However, welding may be accomplished using methods that are approved by the engine manufacturer, and if it can be reasonably expected that the welded repair will not adversely affect the airworthiness of the engine. Many minor parts not subjected to high stresses may be safely repaired by welding. Mounting lugs, how lugs, cylinder fins, rocker box covers, and many parts originally fabricated by welding are in this category. The welded part should be suitably stress relieved after welding. However, before welding any engine part, consult the manufacturer's instructions for the engine concerned to see if it is approved for repair by welding. Parts requiring use of paint for protection or appearance should be repainted according to the engine manufacturer's recommendations. Aluminum alloy parts should have original, exterior painted surfaces rubbed smooth to provide a proper paint base. See that surfaces to be painted are thoroughly cleaned. Care must be taken to avoid paint invading surfaces. Exterior aluminum parts should be primed first with a thin coat of zinc chromate primer. After the primer is dry, parts should be painted with engine enamel that should be air dried until hard, or baked for 1-2 hour at 82 degrees C 180 degrees F. Aluminum parts from which the paint has not been removed may be repainted without the use of a priming coat, provided no bare aluminum is exposed. Any studs that are bent, broken, damaged, or loose must be replaced. After a stud has been removed, the tapped stud hole should be examined for size and condition of threads. If it is necessary to re-tap the stud hole, it also is necessary to use a suitable oversized stud. Studs that have been broken off, flush with the case, must be drilled and removed with suitable stud remover. Be careful not to damage any threads. When replacing studs, coat the coarse threads of the stud with an anti-seize compound. Cylinder assembly reconditioning. Cylinder and piston assemblies are inspected according to the procedures contained in the engine manufacturer's manuals, charts, and service bulletins. A general procedure for inspecting and reconditioning cylinders is discussed in the following section, to provide an understanding of the operations involved. Visually inspect the head fins for other damage besides cracks. Denser bends in the fins should be left alone, unless there is danger of cracking. Where pieces of fin are missing, the sharp edges should be filed to a smooth contour. Fin breakage in a concentrated area causes dangerous local hot spots. Fin breakage near the spark plug bushings, or on the exhaust side of the cylinder, is obviously more dangerous than in other areas. When removing or reprofiling a cylinder fin, follow the instructions and the limits in the manufacturer's manual. Inspect spark plug inserts for the condition of the threads and for looseness. Run the tap of the proper size through the bushing. Very often, the inside threads of the bushing are burned. If more than one thread is missing, the bushing should be rejected. Tighten a plug in the bushing to check for looseness. Piston and piston pins. If the old piston is to be reused, or a new piston is to be used, measure the outside of the piston by means of a micrometer. Measurements must be taken in several directions, and on the skirt, as well as on the land section. Check these sizes against the cylinder size. Most engines use cam ground pistons, to compensate for the greater expansion parallel to the pin during engine operation. The diameter of these pistons measures several thousandths of an inch larger at an angle to the piston pin hole, than parallel to the pin hole. Inspect the ring groove for evidence of wear. The groove needs to be checked for side clearance with a feeler gauge to determine the amount of wear in the grooves. Examine the piston pin for scoring, cracks, excessive wear, and pitting. Check the clearance between the piston pin and the bore of the piston pin bosses using a telescopic gauge and a micrometer. Use the magnetic particle method to inspect the pin for cracks. Since the pins are often case hardened, cracks show up inside the pin more often than they on the outside. Check the pin for bends using V-blocks and a dial indicator on the surface plate. Figure 1014 measure the fit of the plugs in the pin. In many cases, the pistons and piston pins are routinely replaced at overhaul. 1012. Figure 1014. Checking a piston pin for bends, valves and valve springs. Critical areas of the valve include the base and hip figure 1015, both of which should be examined for pitting and excessive wear. Minor pitting on valve faces can sometimes be removed by grinding. Be sure the valve guides are clean before inspection. Often, carbon covers pits inside the guide. If a guide in this condition is put back in service, carbon again collects in the pits and valve sticking results. Besides pits, stores, and burned areas inside the valve guide, inspect them for wear or looseness. Inspection of valve seat inserts before they are refaced is mostly a matter of determining if there is enough of the seat left to correct any pitting, burning, scoring, or out of trueness. Refacing valve seats. The valve seat inserts of aircraft engine cylinders usually are in need of refacing at every overhaul. They are refaced to provide a true, clean, and correct size seat for the valve. 
When valve guides or valve seats are replaced in a cylinder, the seats must be made concentric with the valve guide. Low power engines can use either bronze or steel seats. Bronze seats, although not widely used on current engines, are made of aluminum bronze or phosphor bronze alloys. Steel seats are commonly used for valve seats on higher powered engines, and are made of heat resistant steel with a layer of stellite steel alloy on the valve contact surface. Stellite seats can require a special stone to grind this very hard material. Steel valve seats are replaced by grinding equipment. Quicker 1016 bronze seats are replaced preferably by the use of cutters or remos, but they may be ground when this equipment is not available. The only disadvantage of using a stone on bronze is that the soft metal loads the stone to such an extent that much time is consumed in redressing the stone to keep it clean. The equipment used on steel seats can be either wet or dry valve seat grinding equipment. The wet grinder uses a mixture of soluble oil and water to wash away the chips and to keep the stone and seat cool. This produces a smoother, more accurate job than the dry grinder. The stones may be either silicon carbide or aluminum oxide. Before replacing the seat, make sure that the valve guide is in good condition, clean, and does not have to be replaced. Mount the cylinder firmly in the hold down fixture. An expanding pilot is inserted in the valve guide from the inside of the valve face. Figure 1015. Valve face surface. Figure 1016. Valve seat grinding equipment. 1013. Cylinder, and an expander screw is inserted in the pilot from the top of the guide. Figure 1017 The pilot must be tied in the guide, because any movement can cause a poor grind. The fluid hose is inserted through one of the spark plug inserts. The three grades of stones available for use are classified as rough, finishing, and polishing stones. The rough stone is designed to true and clean the seat. The finishing stone must follow the rough to remove grinding marks and produce a smooth finish. The polishing stone does just as the name implies, and is used only where a highly polished seat is desired. The stones are installed on special stone holders. The face of the stone is proved by a diamond dresser. The stone should be replaced whenever it is proved or loaded, and when the stone is first installed on the stone holder. The diamond dresser also may be used to cut down the diameter of the stone. Dressing of the stone should be kept to a minimum as a matter of conservation, therefore, it is desirable to have sufficient stone holders for all the stones to be used on the job. Grinding. Fluid hose. Stone holder. Spacing washers. Stone. Eyelid. Expander screw. Figure 1017. Valve seat grinding setup. In the actual grinding job, considerable skill is required in handling the grinding gun. The gun must be centered accurately on the stone holder. If the gun is tilted off center, shattering of the stone results and a rough grind is produced. It is very important that the stone be rotated at a speed that permits grinding instead of rubbing. This speed is approximately 8000 to 10,000 revolutions per minute RPM. Excessive pressure on the stone can slow it down. It is not a good technique to let the stone grind at slow speed by putting pressure on the stone when starting or stopping the gun. The maximum pressure used on the stone at any time should be no more than that exerted by the weight of the gun. Another practice, conducive to good grinding, is to ease off on the stone every second or so to let the coolant wash away the chips on the seat. This rhythmic grinding action also helps keep the stone up to its correct speed. Since it is quite a job to replace a seat, remove as little material as possible during the grinding. Inspect the job frequently to prevent unnecessary grinding. The rough stone is used until the seat is true to the valve guide, and until all pits, scores, or burnt areas are removed. Figure 1018 After refacing, the seat should be smooth and true. The finishing stone is used only until the seat has a smooth, polished appearance. Extreme caution should be used when grinding with the finishing stone to prevent shattering. The size and trueness of the seat can be checked by several methods. Run out of the seat is checked with a special dial indicator and should not exceed 0.002 inch. The size of the seat may be determined by using Prussian blue. Prussian blue is used to check for contact transfer from one surface to the other. To check the fit of the seat, spread a thin coat of Prussian blue evenly on the seat. Press the valve onto the seat. The blue transfer to the valve indicates the contact surface. The contact surface should be one third to two thirds the width of the valve face and in the middle of the face. In some cases, a go and no go gauge is used in place of the valve. Seat out of alignment with guide needs further rough grinding. Excessive fitting true and clean ready for finished grind. Figure 1018. Valve seat grinding. 1014. When making the Prussian blue check. If Prussian blue is not used, the same check may be made by lapping the valve lightly to the seat. Lapping is accomplished by using a small amount of lapping compound placed between the valve face and seat. The valve is then moved in a rotary motion back and forth until the lapping compound grinds slightly into the surface. After cleaning the lapping contact compound off, the contact area can be seen. Examples of test results are shown in figure 1019. If the seat contacts the upper third of the valve face, grind off the top corner of the valve seat. Figure 1020 such grinding is called narrowing grinding. 
This permits the seat to contact the center third of the valve face without touching the upper portion of the valve face. If the seat contacts the bottom third of the valve face, right off the inner corner of the valve seat. Figure 1021 The seat is narrowed by a stone other than the standard angle. It is common practice to use a 15 degrees angle and 45 degrees angle cutting stone on the 30 degrees angle valve seat and the 30 degrees angle and 75 degrees angle stone on the 45 degrees angle valve seat. Figure 1022 Upper corner upper corner 30 degrees Inner corner 45 degrees 75 degrees 30 degrees 45 degrees 15 degrees Seat seat Inner corner Figure 1022 Valve seat angles If the valve seat has been cut or ground too much, the valve contacts the seat too far up into the cylinder head, and the valve clearance, spring tension, and the fit of the valve to the seat is affected. To check the height of a valve, insert the valve into the guide, and bolt it against the seat. Check the height of the valve stem above the rocker box or some other fixed position. Before replacing the valve seat, consult the overhaul manual for the particular model engine. Each manufacturer specifies the desired angle for grinding and narrowing the valve seat. 45 degrees stone valve. Seat. Seat. Grind seat to 45 degrees valve and seat ground to 45 degrees. Figure 1019. Fitting the valve and seat. 30 degrees stone. Seat. Seat. Reduce seat 1 slash 3 with 30 degrees stone top edge reduced to 30 degrees. Figure 1020. Grinding top surface of the valve seat. Valve. 75 degrees stone. Seat. Seat. Reduce seat 1 slash 3 with 75 degrees stone lower edge reduced to 75 degrees. Figure 1021. Grinding the inner corner of the valve seat. Valve. 1015. Valve reconditioning. One of the most common jobs during engine overhaul is grinding the valves. The equipment used should preferably be a wet valve grinder. With this type of machine, a mixture of soluble oil and water is used to keep the valve cool and carry away the grinding chips. Like many machine jobs, valve grinding is mostly a matter of setting up the machine. The following points should be checked or accomplished before starting the grind. Through the stone by means of a diamond nib. The machine is turned on, and the diamond is drawn across the stone, cutting just deep enough to through and clean the stone. Determine the face angle of the valve, being ground and set the movable head of the machine to correspond to this valve angle. Usually, valves are ground to the standard angles of 30 degrees or 45 degrees. However, in some instances, an interference fit of 0.5 degrees or 1.5 degrees less than the standard angle may be ground on the valve face. P-H-E-I-N-T-E-R-F-E-R-E-N-C-E-F-I-T-I-S-U-S-E-D-T-O-O-P-T-I-N-M-O-R-E positive seal by means of a narrow contact surface. Figure 1023 Theoretically, there is a line contact between the valve and seat. With this line contact, the load that the valve exerts against the seat is concentrated in a very small area, thereby increasing the unit load at any one spot. The interference fit is especially beneficial during the first few hours of operation after an overhaul. The positive seal reduces the possibility of a burned valve or seat that a leaking valve might produce. After the first few hours of running, these angles tend to pound down and become identical. Notice that the interference angle is ground into the valve, not the seat. It is easier to change the angle of the valve grinder workhead than to change the angle of a valve seat grinder stone. Do not use an interference fit unless the manufacturer approves it. 45 degrees. Line contact. 44 degrees. Figure 1023. Interference fit of valve and valve seat. Install the valve into the chuck and adjust the chuck so that the valve face is approximately 2 inches from the chuck. Figure 1024, if the valve is chucked any further out, there is danger of excessive wobble and also a possibility of grinding into the stem. There are various types of valve grinding machines. In one type, the stone is moved across the valve face, in another, the valve is moved across the stone. Whichever type is used, the following procedures are typical of those performed when refacing a valve. Check the travel of the valve face across the stone. The valve should completely pass the stone on both sides, yet not travel far enough to grind the stem. There are stops on the machine that can be set to control this travel. With the valve set correctly in place, turn on the machine and the grinding fluid so that it splashes on the valve face. Back the grinding wheel off all the way. Place the valve directly in front of the stone. Figure 1025 slowly bring the wheel forward until a light cut is made on the valve. The intensity of the grind is measured by sound more than anything else. Slowly draw the valve back and forth across the stone without increasing the cut. Move the workhead table back and forth using the full face of the stone, but always keep the valve face on the stone. When the sound of the grind diminishes, indicating that some valve material has been removed, move the workhead table to the extreme left to stop rotation of the valve. Inspect the valve to determine if further grinding is necessary. If another cut must be made, bring the valve in front of the stone, then advance the stone out to the valve. 
Do not increase the cut without having the valve directly in front of the stone. An important precaution in valve grinding, as in any kind of grinding, is to make light cuts only. Heavy cuts cause shattering, and may make the valve surface so rough that much time is lost in obtaining the desired finish. After grinding, check the valve margin to be sure that the valve edge has not been ground too thin. A thin edge is called a better edge and can lead to pre-ignition. The valve edge would burn away in a short period of time, and the cylinder would have to be overhauled again. Figure 1026 shows a valve with a normal margin and one with a better edge. The valve tip may be resurfaced on the valve grinder. The tip is ground to remove cupping or wear, and also to adjust valve clearances on some engines. The valve is held by a clamp on the side of the stone. Figure 1027 with the machine and grinding fluid turned on, the valve is pushed lightly against the stone and swung back. 1016. Work at table. Travel adjusted by stops. Valve adjusted correctly. Loop. And stop prevents grinding the stem. Out in. Figure 1024. Valve installed in grinding machine. Figure 1025. Valve and chuck ready to grind. Normal margin. Feather edge. Figure 1026. Engine valves showing normal margin and a feather edge. Shield. Stone. Figure 1027. Grinding a valve tip. And forth. Do not swing the valve stem off either edge of the stone. Because of the tendency for the valve to overheat during this grinding, be sure plenty of grinding fluid covers the tip. Grinding of the valve tip may remove, or partially remove, the bevel on the edge of the valve. To restore this bevel, mount a V-way approximately 45 degrees to the grinding stone. Hold the valve onto the V-way and twist the valve tip onto the stone. With a light touch, grind all the way around the tip. This bevel prevents scratching the valve guide when the valve is installed. Valve lapping and leak testing. After the grinding procedure is finished, it is sometimes necessary that the valve be lapped to the seat. This is done by applying a small amount of lapping compound to the valve face, inserting the valve into the guide, and rotating the valve with the lapping tool until a smooth, gray finish appears at the contact area. The appearance of a correctly lapped valve is shown in figure 1028. 1017. Smooth, even gray band. Sharply defined edges. Figure 1028. A correctly lapped valve. After the lapping process is finished, be sure that all lapping compound is removed from the valve face, seat, and adjacent areas. The final step is to check the mating surface for leaks to see if it is sealing properly. This is done by installing the valve in the cylinder, holding the valve by the stem with the fingers, and pouring kerosene or solvent into the valve port. While holding finger pressure on the valve stem, check to see if the kerosene is leaking past the valve into the combustion chamber. If it is not, the valve reseating operation is finished. If kerosene is leaking past the valve, continue the lapping operation until the leakage is stopped. The incorrect indications are of value in diagnosing improper valve and valve seat grinding. Incorrect indications, their cause, and remedy are shown in figure 1029. Piston repairs. Piston repairs are not required as often as cylinder repairs, since most of the wear is between the piston ring and cylinder wall, valve stem and guide, and valve face and seat. A lesser amount of wear is encountered between the piston skirt and cylinder, ring and ring groove, or piston pin and bosses. The most common repair is the removal of scores. Usually, these may be removed only on the piston skirt if they are very light. On engines where the entire rotating and reciprocating assembly is balanced, the pistons must weigh within one fourth ounce of each other. When a new piston is installed, it must be within the same weight tolerance as the one removed. It is not enough to have the pistons matched alone, they must be matched to the crankshaft, connecting rods, piston pins, etc. To make weight adjustments on new pistons, the manufacturer provides a heavy section at the base of the skirt. To decrease weight, file metal evenly off the inside of this heavy section. The piston weight can be decreased easily, but welding, metalizing, or plating cannot be done to increase the piston weight. If ring grooves are worn or stepped, the pistons are normally replaced. Small nicks on the edge of the piston pin boss may be sanded down. Deep scores inside the boss, or anywhere around the boss, are definite reasons for rejection. It has become more economical to replace pistons, rather than reconditioning and reusing old ones, especially during overhaul, cylinder grinding and toning. If a cylinder has excessive taper, out of roundness, step, or its maximum size is beyond limits, it can be reground to the next allowable oversize. If the cylinder walls are lightly rusted, scored, or pitted, the damage may be removed by toning or lapping. Regrinding a cylinder is a specialized job that the power plant mechanic is not usually expected to be able to do. However, the mechanic must be able to recognize when a cylinder needs regrinding, and he or she must know what constitutes a good or bad job. Generally, standard aircraft cylinder oversizes are 0.010 inch, 0.015 inches, 0.020 inch, or 0.030 inch. Aircraft cylinders have relatively thin walls and may have a nitrided surface that must not be ground away. 
Nitriding is a surface hardening process that hardens the steel surface to a depth of several thousandths of an inch. Any one manufacturer usually does. Indication fuzzy edge. Cause rough grind. Remedy regrind valve or continue lapping. Figure 1029. Incorrectly lapped valves. Too narrow contact. Unintentional interference fit. Grind both valve and set. Two lap bands improper narrowing of C3 narrow seat. N18. Not allow all of the above oversizes. Some manufacturers do not allow regrinding to an oversize at all. The manufacturer's overhaul manual, or parts catalog, usually lists the oversizes allowed for a particular make and model engine. To determine the regrind size, the standard bore size must be known. This usually can be determined from the manufacturer's specifications or manuals. The regrind size is figured from the standard bore. For example, a certain cylinder has a standard bore of 3.875 inches. To have a cylinder ground to 0.015 inches over size, it is necessary to grind to a bore diameter of 3.890 inch 3.875 plus 0.015. A tolerance of plus or minus 0.0005 inches is usually accepted for cylinder grinding. Another factor to consider when determining the size to which a cylinder must be regrounded is the maximum wear that has occurred. If there are spots in the cylinder wall that are worn larger than the first oversize, then obviously it is necessary to grind to the next oversize to clean up the entire cylinder. The type of finish desired in the cylinder is an important consideration when ordering a regrind. Some engine manufacturers specify a fairly rough finish on the cylinder walls and allows the rings to seat even if they are not lapped to the cylinder. Other manufacturers desire a smooth finish to which a lapped ring seats without much change in ring or cylinder dimensions. The latter type of finish is more expensive to produce. The standard used when measuring the finish of a cylinder wall is known as micro-inch root mean square micro-inch RMS. In the finish where the depth of the grinding scratches are 1 millionth 0.000001 of an inch deep, it is specified as 1 micro-inch RMS. Most aircraft cylinders are ground to a finish of 15 to 20 micro-inch RMS. Several low-powered engines have cylinders that are ground to a relatively rough 20 to 30 micro-inch RMS finish. On the other end of the scale, some manufacturers require a super finish of approximately 4 to 6 micro inch RMS. Cylinder grinding is accomplished by a firmly mounted stone that revolves around the cylinder bore, as well as up and down the length of the cylinder barrel. Figure 1030 the cylinder, the stone, or both may move to get this relative movement. The size of the grind is determined by the distance the stone is set away from the center line of the cylinder. Some cylinder bore grinding machines produce a perfectly straight bore, while others are designed to grind a choke bore. A choke bore grind refers to the manufacturing process in which the cylinder walls are ground to produce a smaller internal diameter at the top than at the bottom. The purpose of this type grinder taper is to maintain a straight cylinder wall during operation. As a cylinder heats up during operation, the head and top of the cylinder are subjected to more heat than the bottom. This causes greater expansion at the top than at the bottom, thereby maintaining the desired straight wall. After grinding a cylinder, it may be necessary to hone the cylinder bore to produce the desired finish. In this case, specify the cylinder regrind size to allow for some metal removal during honing. The usual allowance for honing is 0.001 inch. If a final cylinder bore size of 3.890 inches is desired, specify the regrind size of 3.889 inches, and then hone to 3.890 inches. Stone. Cylinder. Grinder. Figure 1030. Cylinder bore grinding. 1019. There are several different makes and models of cylinder homes. The burnishing home is used only to produce the desired finish on the cylinder wall. The more elaborate micromatic home can also be used to straighten out the cylinder walls. A burnishing home should not be used in an attempt to straighten cylinder walls. Figure 1031 Since the stones are only spring-loaded, they follow the contour of the cylinder wall and may aggravate a tapered condition. Deglazing the cylinder walls is accomplished with the use of a deglazing home. A cross-hatch pattern must be placed on the cylinder wall to allow for piston ring break-in. This is accomplished by a deglazing home turned by a drill, being moved in and out of the cylinder rapidly. Figure 1032. After the cylinders have been reground or deglazed, or both, check the size and wall finish, and check for evidence of overheating or grinding cracks, before installing on an engine. Reassembly. Before starting reassembly, all serviceable and new engine components need to be cleaned, organized, and laid out in the order they are to be assembled. A popular method of engine assembly is for the engine to be assembled at one workstation with the same technicians completing the total assembly of stone. The engine. It is also important to refer to the parts catalog to ensure that the correct hardware is used during the assembly of the engine. 
The engine overhaul manual should be referred to for information on the use of safety wire, self-locking nuts, and torque values. During assembly, the components should be pre-lubricated as the overhaul manual sets forth. It is important to follow the manufacturer's overhaul assembly procedures completely and perform all checks and procedures that are called for in the manual. Installation and testing. Engine testing of reciprocating engines. The procedures and equipment used in determining that an engine is ready for airworthy service and is in excellent mechanical condition normally requires the use of a test stand or test cell, although the aircraft can be used. Figure 1033 The method of engine testing, or run that takes place during overhaul prior to delivery of the engine, is critical to the airworthiness of the engine. It must be emphasized that engine run-in is as vital as any other phase of engine overhaul, for it is the means by which the quality of a new, or newly overhauled engine is checked, and it is the final step in the preparation of an engine for service. Thus, the reliability and potential service life of an engine is in question until it is satisfactorily passed the cell test. The test serves a dual purpose. First, it accomplishes piston ring run-in and bearing burnishing. Second, it provides valuable information that it used to evaluate engine performance and determine engine condition. To provide proper oil flow to the upper portion of the cylinder barrel walls with a minimum loss of oil, it is important that piston rings be properly seated in the cylinder in which they are installed. The process is called piston ring run and breathing, and is accomplished chiefly by controlled operation of the engine in the high speed range. In proper piston ring, cylinder, figure 1031, Cylinder owning. Figure 1033. Test stand. Figure 1032. Cross hatch pattern on cylinder wall. 1020. Conditioning, or run in, may result in unsatisfactory engine operation with high oil consumption. A process called bearing burnishing creates a highly polished surface on new bearings and bushings installed during overhaul. The burnishing is usually accomplished during the first periods of the engine run in at comparatively slow engine speeds. The failure of any part during engine testing or run-in requires that the engine be returned, repaired, and completely retested. After an engine has successfully completed test requirements, it is then specially treated to prevent corrosion if it is shipped or stored before being installed in an aircraft. During the final run-in period during testing, the engines are operated on the proper grade of fuel prescribed for the particular kind of engine. The oil system is serviced with a mixture of corrosion preventive compound and engine oil. The temperature of this mixture is maintained at 105 degrees C to 121 degrees C. Near the end of final run-in, corrosion preventive mixture CPM is used as the engine lubricant. The engine induction passages and combustion chambers are also treated with CPM by an aspiration method. CPM is drawn or breathed into the engine. Test cell requirements. The test cell requires an area to mount and bolt the engine for testing. The cell needs to have the controls, instruments, and any special equipment to evaluate the total performance of the engine. A test club should be used for testing instead of a flight propeller. Figure 1034 A test club provides more cooling airflow and the correct amount of load. The operational tests and test procedures vary with individual engines, but the basic requirements are generally closely related. Engine instruments. The test cell control room contains the controls used to operate the engine and the instruments used to measure various temperatures and pressures, fuel flow, and other. Figure 1034. Test club. Factors. These devices are necessary in providing an accurate check and an evaluation of the operating engine. The control room is separate from, but adjacent to, the space test cell that houses the engine being tested. The safe, economical, and reliable testing of modern aircraft engines depends largely upon the use of instruments. In engine run and procedures, the same basic engine instruments are used as when the engine is installed in the aircraft, plus some additional connections to these instruments, and some indicating and measuring devices that cannot be practically installed in the aircraft. Instruments used in the testing procedures are inspected and calibrated periodically, as are instruments installed in the aircraft, thus, accurate information concerning engine operation is ensured. Engine instruments can operate using different methods, some mechanically, some electrically, and some by sensing the direct pressure of air or liquid. Some of the basic instruments are 1. Carburetor air temperature gauge 2. Fuel pressure gauge 3. Fuel flow meter 4. Manifold pressure gauge 5. Oil temperature gauge 6. Oil pressure gauge 7. Tachometer 8. Exhaust gas temperature gauge 9. Cylinder head temperature gauge 10. Torque meter, instrument markings, ranges of operation, minimum and maximum limits, and the interpretation of these markings are general to all the instruments. Generally, the instrument marking system consists of three colors, red, yellow, and green. A red line, or mark, indicates a point beyond which a dangerous operating condition exists. A red arc indicates a dangerous operating range due generally to an engine propeller vibration range. This arc can be passed through, but the engine cannot be operated in this area. 
of the tube. The red mark is used more commonly and is located radially on the cover glass or dial face. The yellow arc covers a given range of operation and is an indication of caution. Generally, the yellow arc is located on the outer circumference of the instrument cover glass or dial face. The green arc shows a normal and safe range of operation. When the markings appear on the cover glass, a white line is used as an index mark, often called a slippage mark. The white radial mark indicates any movement between the cover glass and the case, a condition that would cause mislocation of the other range and limit markings. 1021. Carburetor air temperature CAT indicator. Measured at the carburetor in trance, carburetor air temperature CAT is regarded by many as an indication of induction system ice formation. Although it serves this purpose, it also provides many other important items of information. The power plant is a heat machine, and the temperature of its components, or the fluids flowing through it, affects the combustion process either directly or indirectly. The temperature level of the induction air affects not only the charge density, but also the vaporization of the fuel. CAT is also useful for checking induction system condition. Backfiring is indicated as a momentary rise on the gauge, provided it is of sufficient severity for the heat to be sensed at the carburetor air measuring point. A sustained induction system fire shows a continuous increase of CAT. The CAT should be noted before starting and just after shutdown. The temperature before starting is the best indication of the temperature of the fuel in the carburetor body and tells whether vaporization is sufficient for the initial firing or whether the mixture must be augmented by priming. If an engine has been shut down for only a short time, the residual heat in the carburetor may make it possible to rely on the vaporizing heat in the fuel and power plant. Priming would then be unnecessary. After shutdown, a high cat is a warning that the fuel trapped in the carburetor will expand, reducing high internal pressure. When a high temperature is present at this time, the fuel line and manifold valves should be open so that the pressure can be relieved by allowing fuel passage back to the tank. The cat gauge indicates the temperature of the air before it enters the carburetor. The temperature reading is sensed by a bulb or electric sensor. In the test cell, the sensor is located in the air intake passage to the engine and, in an aircraft, it is located in the ram air intake duct. The cat gauge is calibrated in the centigrade scale. Figure 1035. This gauge, like many other multi-engine aircraft instruments, is a dual gauge. Two gauges, each with a separate pointer and scale, are used in the same case. Notice the range markings used. The yellow arc indicates a range from 10 degrees C to plus 15 degrees C, since the danger of icing occurs between these temperatures. The green range indicates the normal operating range from plus 15 degrees C to plus 40 degrees C. The red line indicates the maximum operating temperature of 40 degrees C. Any operation at a temperature over this value places the engine in danger of detonation. Fuel pressure indicator. The fuel pressure gauge is calibrated in pounds per square inch psi of pressure. It is used during the test run-in to measure engine fuel pressure at the carburetor inlet, the fuel feed valve discharge nozzle, and the main fuel supply line. Fuel gauges are located in the operator's control room and are connected by flexible lines to the different points at which pressure readings are desired during the testing procedures. In some aircraft installations, the fuel pressure is sensed at the carburetor or fuel injection unit inlet of each engine, and the pressure is indicated on individual gauges on the instrument panel. Figure 1036 the dial is calibrated in graduations and is extended and numbered. The numbers range from 0 to 10 in this example. The red line on the dial at the 2 pound psi graduation shows the minimum fuel pressure allowed during flight. The green arc shows the desired range of operation, which is 2 to 9 psi. The red line at the 9 psi graduation indicates the maximum allowable fuel pressure. Fuel pressures vary with the type of fuel system installation. 150 100 50 0 50 C degrees 150 100 50 0 50 50 0 yellow green red figure 1036 engine instrument clusters figure 1035 carburetor air temperature gauge 1022 and the size of the engine when fuel injection systems are used the fuel pressure range is much higher the minimum allowable pressure is approximately 10 psi and the maximum is generally 25 psi oil pressure indicator the main oil pressure reading is taken at the pressure side of the oil pump. Generally, there is only one oil pressure gauge for each aircraft engine. The oil pressure gauge dial does not show the pressure range or limits for all installations. Figure 1036 The actual markings for specific aircraft may be found in the aircraft specifications or type certificate data sheets. The lower red line at 25 psi indicates the minimum oil pressure permissible in flight. The green arc between 60 to 85 psi illustrates the desired operating oil pressure range. The red line at 100 psi indicates maximum permissible oil pressure. The oil pressure gauge indicates the pressure inside that the oil of the lubricating system is being supplied to the moving parts of the engine. The engine should be shut down immediately if the gauge fails to register pressure when the engine is operating. 
Excessive oscillation of the gauge pointer indicates that there is air in the lines leading to the gauge, or that some unit of the oil system is functioning improperly. Oil temperature indicator. During engine run-in in the test cell, engine oil temperature readings are taken at the oil inlet and outlet. From these readings, it can be determined if the engine heat transferred to the oil is low, normal, or excessive. This information is of extreme importance during the braking and process of large reciprocating engines. The oil temperature gauge line in the aircraft is connected at the oil inlet to the engine. Three range markings are used on the oil temperature gauge. The green arc in figure 1036 on the dial shows the minimum oil temperature permissible for ground operational checks or during flight. The green mark between 25 degrees F and below 245 degrees F shows the desired oil temperature for continuous engine operation. The red mark at 245 degrees F indicates the maximum permissible oil temperature. Fuel flow meter. The fuel flow meter measures the amount of fuel delivered to the engine. During engine testing procedures, the fuel flow to the engine can be measured by three different methods. A direct flow meter, a pressure-based flow meter, or a turbine sensor-based flow meter. The direct reading flow meter uses a series of calibrated tubes located in the control room. The tubes are of various sizes to indicate different volumes of fuel flow. Each tube contains a float that can be seen by the operator, and as the fuel flow through the tube varies, the float is either raised or lowered, indicating the amount of fuel flow. From these indications, the operator can determine whether an engine is operating at the correct fuel-slash-air mixture for a given power setting. Reciprocating engines on light aircraft usually use a fuel pressure gauge that is also used for the flow meter. This is because the fuel flow is proportional to the fuel pressure in this system. Fuel flow is measured normally in gallons per hour. In most turbine aircraft installations, the fuel flow indicating system consists of a transmitter and an indicator for each engine. The fuel flow transmitter is conveniently mounted in the engine's accessory section and measures the fuel flow between the engine-driven fuel pump and the fuel control device. The transmitter is an electrical device that contains a turbine that turns faster as the flow increases, which increases the electrical signal to the indicator. The fuel flow transmitter is connected electrically to the indicator located on the aircraft flight deck or on the test cell operator's panel. The reading on the indicator on turbine aircraft is calibrated to record the amount of fuel flow in pounds of fuel per hour. Manifold pressure indicator. The preferred type of instrument for measuring the manifold pressure on reciprocating engines is a gauge that records the pressure as an absolute pressure reading. Absolute pressure takes into account the atmospheric pressure plus the pressure in the intake manifold. To read the manifold pressure of the engines, a specially designed manifold pressure gauge that indicates absolute manifold pressure in inches of mercury Hg is used. The red line indicates the maximum manifold pressure permissible during takeoff. The manifold pressure gauge range markings and indications vary with different kinds of engines and installations. Figure 1037 illustrates the dial of a typical manifold pressure gauge and shows how the range markings are positioned. The green arc starts at 35 Hg and continues to the 44 Hg. The red line on the gauge at 49 Hg shows the manifold pressure recommended for takeoff. This pressure should not be exceeded. Tachometer indicator. The tachometer for reciprocating engines shows the engine crankshaft RPM. The system used for testing the engine is the same as the system in the aircraft installation. The tachometer, often referred to as TACH, is calibrated in hundreds with graduations at every 100 RPM interval. The dial shown in figure 1038 starts at 0 RPM and goes to 35 3500 RPM. The green arc indicates the RPM range within operation that is permissible. The red line indicates the maximum RPM permissible during takeoff. Any RPM beyond this value is an overspeed condition. 1023. 25, 20, 15, 25, 20, 15, 10, 75, man, in, hg, abs, 30, 35, 40, 45, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, 60, 70, 65, 75, figure 1037, manifold pressure gauge, 50, 55, 60, 65, green red, Sill, M, head C degrees, 300, 200, 100, 0, 300, 200, 100, 0, 300, 200, 100, 0, 300, 200, 100, 0, blue, green, red, figure 1038, tachometer, turbine engines use percent RPM indicators due to the high RPM that the engines generally operate. Each rotating assembly in an engine has its own percent RPM indicator. 
the 100% position on the indicator is the highest RPM the engine can operate. Red lines and green arcs operate the same as with reciprocating engines. Cylinder head temperature indicator. During the engine test procedures, the cylinder head temperatures of various cylinders on the reciprocating engine are normally tested. Thermocouples are connected to several cylinders and, by a selector switch, any cylinder head temperature can be indicated on the indicators. When installed in the aircraft, there is sometimes only one thermocouple lead and indicator for each engine installed in an aircraft. Cylinder head temperatures are indicated by a gauge connected to a thermocouple attached to the cylinder, that tests show to be the hottest on an engine in a particular installation. The thermocouple may be placed in a special casket located under a rear spark plug, or in a special well in the top or rear of the cylinder head. The temperature recorded at either of these points is merely a reference or control temperature, but as long as it is kept within the prescribed limits, the temperatures inside the cylinder dome, exhaust valve, and piston is within a satisfactory range. Since the thermocouple is attached to only one cylinder, it can do no more than give evidence of general engine temperature. While normally it can be assumed that the remaining cylinder temperatures are lower, conditions such as detonation are not indicated unless they occur in the cylinder that has the thermocouple attached. The cylinder head temperature gauge range marking is similar to that of the manifold pressure and tachometer indicator. The cylinder head temperature gauge is a dual gauge that incorporates two separate temperature scales. Figure 1039 The scales are calibrated in increments of 10 degrees, with numerals at the 0 degrees, 100 degrees, 200 degrees, and 300 degrees graduations. The space between any two graduation marks represents 10 degrees C. Torque meter. Most torque systems use an oil pressure output from a torque valve to indicate actual engine power output at various power settings. The torque meter indicates the amount of torque being produced at the propeller shaft. A helical gear moves back and forth as the torque on the propeller shaft varies. This gear, acting on the piston, positions a valve that meters the oil pressure proportionally to the torque being produced. A change in Figure 1039 Cylinder head temperature gauge 1024 Pressure from the valve that is connected to a transducer is then converted to an electrical signal and is transmitted to the flight deck. The torque meter can read out in foot-pounds of torque, percent of horsepower, or horsepower. The earlier systems read out inside, and the flight engineer converted this to the correct power setting. Figure 1040 Some systems use strain gauges to attach to the ring gear to provide an electrical signal directly to the readout. Warning systems. Many of the miscellaneous gauges and devices indicate only that a system is functioning or has failed to function. On some aircraft, a warning light illuminates when the fuel pressure or oil pressure is low. Reciprocating engine operation. The operation of the power plant is controlled from the cockpit or flight deck. Some installations have numerous control handles and levers connected to the engine by rods, cables, belt rings, pulleys, etc. In most cases, the control handles are conveniently mounted on quadrants in the flight deck. Placards, or markings, are placed on the quadrant to indicate the functions and positions of the levers. In some installations, friction clutches are installed to hold the controls in place. Engine instruments. The term engine instruments usually includes all instruments required to measure and indicate the functioning of the power plant. The engine instruments are generally installed on the instrument panel so that all of them can easily be observed at one time. Manifold pressure, RPM, engine temperature, oil temperature, hat, and the fuel-air ratio can be controlled by manipulating the flight deck controls. Coordinating the movement of the controls with the instrument readings protects against exceeding operating limits. Engine operation is usually limited by specified operating ranges of the following. 45, 40, 50, fork, 35. FTLBX 100, 30, 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, figure 1040, torque meter readout, 1, crankshaft speed RPM 2, manifold pressure 3, cylinder head temperature 4, hat 5, oil temperature 6, oil pressure 7, fuel pressure 8, fuel flow meter 9, fuel slash air mixture setting, the procedures, pressures, temperatures, and RPM used throughout this section are solely for the purpose of illustration and do not have general application. The operating procedures and limits used on individual mates and models of aircraft engines vary considerably from the values shown here. For exact information regarding a specific engine model, consult the applicable instructions. Engine starting. Before starting the engine, observe the manifold pressure gauge that should read approximate atmospheric barometric pressure when the engine is not running. At sea level, this is approximately 30 hg, and at fields above sea level, the atmospheric pressure is less, depending on the height above sea level. Also, observe all engine gauges for the correct reading for engine off settings. Correct starting technique is an important part of engine operation. 
improper procedures often are used, because some of the basic principles involved in engine operation are misunderstood. Read more about typical procedures for starting reciprocating engines in the airframe and power plant mechanics general handbook. Reoiling. Engines that have undergone overhaul or major maintenance can have air trapped in some of the oil passages that must be removed before the first start. This is done by pre-oiling the engine by cranking, with the spark plugs removed, the engine with the starter, or by hand turning until oil pressure is indicated. A second method is to pump oil under pressure through the oil system using an external pump until oil comes out of the oil outlet of the engine. Hydraulic lock. Whenever a radial engine remains shut down for any length of time beyond a few minutes, oil or fuel may drain into the combustion chambers of the lower cylinders, or accumulate in the lower intake pipes ready to be drawn into the cylinders when the engine starts. Figure 1041 is the 1025. Draining engine oil partially filled intake pipe. Figure 1041. Initial step in developing a hydraulic lock. Piston approaches top center of the compression stroke both valves closed. This liquid being incompressible stops piston movement. If the crankshaft continues to rotate, something must give. Therefore, starting or attempting to start an engine with a hydraulic lock of this nature may cause the affected cylinder to blow out or, more likely, may result in a bent or broken connecting rod. To eliminate a lock, remove either the front or rear spark plug of the lower cylinders and pull the propeller through in the direction of rotation. The piston expels any liquid that may be present. If the hydraulic lock occurs as a result of overpriming prior to initial engine start, eliminate the lock in the same manner i.e., remove one of the spark plugs from the cylinder and rotate the crankshaft through two turns. Never attempt to clear the hydraulic lock by pulling the propeller through in the direction opposite to normal rotation. This tends to inject the liquid from the cylinder into the intake pipe with the possibility of a complete or partial lock occurring on the subsequent start. Engine warm-up. Proper engine warm-up is important, particularly when the condition of the engine is unknown. Improperly adjusted idle mixture, intermittently firing spark plugs, and improperly adjusted engine valves all have an overlapping effect on engine stability. Therefore, the warm-up should be made at the engine speed where maximum engine stability is obtained. Experience has shown that the optimum warm-up speed is from 1000 to 1600 RPM. The actual speed selected should be the speed at which engine operation is the smoothest, since the smoothest operation is an indication that all phases of engine operation are the most stable. Some engines incorporate temperature compensated oil pressure relief valves. This type of relief valve results in high engine oil pressures immediately after the engine starts, if oil temperatures are very low. Consequently, start the warm-up of these engines at approximately 1000 RPM, and then move to the higher, more stable engine speed, as soon as oil temperature reaches a warmer level. During warm-up, watch the instruments associated with engine operation. This aids in making sure that all phases of engine operation are normal. For example, engine oil pressure should be indicated within 30 seconds after the start. Furthermore, if the oil pressure is not up to or above normal within one minute after the engine starts, the engine should be shut down. Cylinder header coolant temperatures should be observed continually to see that they do not exceed the maximum allowable limit. A lean mixture should not be used to hasten the warm-up. Actually, at the warm-up RPM, there is very little difference in the mixture supplied to the engine, whether the mixture is in a richer lean position, since metering in this power range is governed by throttle position. Carburetor heat can be used as required under conditions leading to ice formation. For engines equipped with a flow-type carburetor, it is desirable to raise the cat during warm-up to prevent ice formation, and to ensure smooth operation. The magneto safety check can be performed during warm-up. Its purpose is to ensure that all ignition connections are secure, and that the ignition system permits operation at the higher power settings used during later phases of the ground check. The time required for proper warm-up gives ample opportunity to perform this simple check, which may disclose a condition that would make it inadvisable to continue operation until after corrections have been made. The magneto safety check is conducted with the propeller in the high RPM low pitch position, at approximately 1000 RPM. Move the ignition switch from both to right and return to both, from both to left, and return to both, from both to off momentarily, and return to both. While switching from both to a single magneto position, a slight but noticeable drop in RPM should occur. This indicates 1026, that the opposite magneto has been properly grounded out. Complete cutting out of the engine when switching from both to off indicates that both magnetos are grounded properly. While in the single magneto position, failure to obtain any RPM drop or failure of the engine to cut out while switching to off indicates that one or both ground connections are faulty. This indicates a safety problem. The magnetos are not secured at shutdown and may fire if the propeller is turned. Ground check. The ground check is performed to evaluate the functioning of the engine by comparing power input as measured by manifold pressure with power output as measured by RPM or torque. 
the engine may be capable of producing a prescribed power, even rated takeoff, and not be functioning properly. Only by comparing the manifold pressure required during the check against a known standard, is an unsuitable condition disclosed. The magneto check can also fail to show shortcomings, since the allowable RPM drop-off is only a measure of an improperly functioning ignition system, and is not necessarily affected by other factors. Conversely, it is possible for the magneto check to prove satisfactory when an unsatisfactory condition is present elsewhere in the engine. The ground check is made after the engine is thoroughly warm. It consists of checking the operation of the power plant and accessory equipment by ear, by visual inspection, and by proper interpretation of instrument readings, control movements, and switch reactions. During the ground check, the aircraft should be headed into the wind, if possible, to take advantage of the cooling airflow. A ground check procedure is outlined below. 1. Control position check. 2. Power flaps if equipped open. 3. Mixture rich. 4. Propeller high RPM. 5. Carburetor heat cold. 6. Check propeller according to propeller manufacturer's instruction. 7. Open throttle to the run-up RPM setting, as per manufacturer's instruction specified RPM and manifold pressure. 8. Ignition system operational check. In performing the ignition system operational check magneto check, the power absorbing characteristics of the propeller in the low fixed pitch position are utilized. In switching to individual magnetos, cutting out the opposite flux results. In the slower rate of combustion, which gives the same effect as retarding the spark advance. The drop in engine speed is a measure of the power loss at this slower combustion rate. When the magneto check is performed, a drop in torque meter pressure indication is a good supplement to the variation in RPM. In cases where the tachometer scale is graduated coarsely, the torque meter variation may give more positive evidence of the power change when switching to the individual magneto condition. The loss in torque meter pressure, not to exceed 10%, can be expected when operating on a single magneto. By comparing the RPM drop with a known standard, the following are determined. 1. Proper timing of each magneto. 2. General engine performance as evidenced by smooth operation. 3. Additional check of the proper connection of the ignition leads. Any unusual roughness on either magneto is an indication of faulty ignition caused by plug fouling or by malfunctioning of the ignition system. The operator should be very sensitive to engine roughness during this check. Lack of drop-off in RPM may be an indication of faulty grounding of one side of the ignition system. Complete cutting out when switching to one magneto is definite evidence that its side of the ignition system is not functioning. Excessive difference in RPM drop-off between the left and right switch positions can indicate a difference in time between the left and right magnetos. Sufficient time should be given to the check on each single switch position to permit complete stabilization of engine speed and manifold pressure. There is a tendency to perform this check too rapidly with resultant wrong indications. Operation as long as one minute on the single ignition system is not excessive. Another point that must be emphasized is the danger of sticking tachometer. The tachometer should be tapped lightly to make sure the indicator needle moves freely. In some cases using older mechanical tachometers, sticking has caused errors in indication to the extent of 100 RPM. Under such conditions, the ignition system could have had as much as a 200 RPM drop with only a 100 RPM drop indicated on the instrument. In most cases, tapping the instrument eliminates the sticking and results in accurate readings. In recording the results of time ignition system check, record the amount of the total RPM drop that occurs rapidly and the amount that occurs slowly. This breakdown in RPM drop provides a means of pinpointing certain troubles in the ignition system. This can reduce unnecessary work by 1027. In finding maintenance to the specific part of the ignition system that is responsible for the trouble, Fast RPM drop is usually the result of either faulty spark plugs or faulty ignition harness. This is true, because faulty plugs or leads, take effect at once. The cylinder goes dead or starts firing intermittently the instant the switch is moved from both to the right or left position. Slow RPM drop usually is caused by incorrect ignition timing or faulty valve adjustment. With late ignition timing, the charge is fired too late in relation to piston travel for the combustion pressures to build up to the maximum at the proper time. The result is a power loss greater than normal for single ignition, because of the lower peak pressures obtained in the cylinder. However, this power loss does not occur as rapidly as that which accompanies a dead spark plug. This explains the slow RPM drop as compared to the instantaneous drop with a dead plug or defective lead. Incorrect valve clearances, through their effect on valve overlap, can cause the mixture to be too rich or too lean. The too rich or too lean mixture may affect one plug more than another, because of the plug location and show up as a slow RPM drop on the ignition check. Switch from both to right and return to both. Switch from both to left and return to both. Observe the RPM drop while operating on the right and left positions. The maximum drop should not exceed that specified by the engine manufacturer. Fuel pressure and oil pressure check. Fuel pressure and oil pressure must be within the established tolerance screen arc for the engine.
propeller pitch check. The propeller is checked to ensure proper operation of the pitch control and the pitch change mechanism. The operation of a controllable pitch propeller is checked by the indications of the tachometer and manifold pressure gauge when the propeller governor control is moved from one position to another. Because each type of propeller requires a different procedure, the applicable manufacturer's instructions should be followed. Power check. Specific RPM and manifold pressure relationship should be checked during each ground check. This can be done at the time the engine is run up to make the magneto check. The purpose of this check is to measure the performance of the engine against an established standard. Calibration tests have determined that the engine is capable of delivering a given power at a given RPM and manifold pressure. The original calibration, or measurement of power, is made by means of a dynamometer in a test cell. During the ground check, power is measured with the propeller. With constant conditions of air density, the propeller, at any fixed pitch position, always requires the same RPM to absorb the same horsepower from the engine. This characteristic is used in determining the condition of the engine. With the governor control set for full low pitch, the propeller operates as a fixed pitch propeller because the engine is static. Under these conditions, the manifold pressure for any specific engine, with the mixture control in rich, indicates whether all the cylinders are operating properly. With one or more dead, or intermittently firing cylinders, the operating cylinders must provide more power for a given RPM. Consequently, the carburetor throttle must be opened further, resulting in higher manifold pressure. Different engines of the same model using the same propeller installation, and at the same barometer and temperature readings, should require the same manifold pressure to within 1 hg. The higher than normal manifold pressure usually indicates a dead cylinder or late ignition timing. An excessively low manifold pressure for a particular RPM usually indicates that the ignition timing is early. Early ignition can cause detonation and loss of power at takeoff power settings. The accuracy of the power check may be affected by the following variables. 1. Wind any appreciable air movement 5 mph or more changes the air load on the propeller blade when it is in the fixed pitch position. A headwind increases the RPM obtainable with a given manifold pressure. A tailwind decreases the RPM. 2. Atmospheric temperatures The effects of variations in atmospheric temperature tend to cancel each other. Higher carburetor intake and cylinder temperatures tend to lower the RPM, but the propeller load is lightened because of the less dense air. 3. Engine and induction system temperature If the cylinder and carburetor temperatures are high because of factors other than atmospheric temperature, a low RPM results since the power is lowered without a compensating lowering of the propeller load. 4. Oil temperature Cold oil tends to hold down the RPM, since the higher viscosity results in increased friction horsepower losses. Idle speed and idle mixture checks. Plug fouling difficulty is the inevitable result of failure to provide a proper idle mixture setting. The tendency seems to be to adjust the idle mixture on the extremely rich side and to compensate for this by adjusting the throttle stop to a relatively high RPM for minimum idling with a properly 1028 adjusted idle mixture setting, it is possible to run the engine at idle RPM for long periods. Such a setting results in a minimum of plug fouling and exhaust smoking, and it pays dividends from the savings on the aircraft brakes after landing and while taxiing. If the wind is not too strong, the idle mixture setting can be checked easily during the ground check as follows. 1. Close throttle. 2. Move the mixture control to the idle cutoff position, and observe the change in RPM. Return the mixture control back to the rich position before engine cutoff. As the mixture control lever is moved into idle cutoff, and before normal drop-off, one of two things may occur momentarily. 1. The engine speed may increase. An increase in RPM, but less than that recommended by the manufacturer usually 20 RPM, indicates proper mixture strength. A greater increase indicates that the mixture is too rich. 2. The engine speed may not increase, or may drop immediately. This indicates that the idle mixture is too lean. The idle mixture should be set to give a mixture slightly richer than best power, resulting in a 10 to 20 RPM rise after idle cutoff. Engine stopping. With each type of engine installation, specific procedures are used in stopping the engine. The general procedure, outlined in the following paragraphs, reduces the time required for stopping, minimizes backfiring tendencies, and prevents overheating of tightly baffled air-cooled engine during operation on the ground. In stopping any aircraft engine, the controls are set as follows, irrespective of the type or fuel system installation. 1. Cowl flaps and any other shutters or doors are always placed in the full open position to avoid overheating the engine, and are left in that position after the engine is stopped to prevent engine residual heat from deteriorating the ignition system. 2. Carburetor air heater control is left in the cold position to prevent damage that may occur from backfire. 3. Constant speed propeller is usually stopped with the control set in the high pitch decrease RPM position. 
No mention is made of the throttle, mixture control, fuel selector valve, and ignition switches in the preceding set of directions, because the operation of these controls varies with the type of carburetor used with the engine. An engine equipped with a carburetor incorporating an idle cutoff mixture control is stopped as follows. 1. Idle the engine by setting the throttle for 800 to 1000 RPM. 2. Move the mixture control to the idle cutoff position. In the flow type carburetor, it equalizes the pressure in the flow chamber and at the discharge nozzle. 3. After the propeller has stopped rotating, place the ignition switch in the off position. In addition to the operations outlined previously, check the functioning of various items of aircraft equipment, such as generator systems, hydraulic systems, ec. Basic engine operating principles. Combustion process. Normal combustion occurs when the fuel-slash-air mixture ignites in the cylinder and burns progressively at a fairly uniform rate across the combustion chamber. When ignition is properly timed, maximum pressure is built up just after the piston has passed top dead center at the end of the compression stroke. The flame fronts start at each spark plug and burn in more or less wave-like forms. Figure 1042 The velocity of the flame travel is influenced by the type of fuel, the ratio of the fuel-slash-air mixture, and the pressure and temperature of the fuel mixture. With normal combustion, the flame travel is about 100 feet slash second. The temperature and pressure within the cylinder rises at a normal rate as the fuel slash air mixture burns. Intake valve exhaust valve. Piston. Crankcase. Connecting rod. Figure 1042. Normal combustion within a cylinder. 1029. Intake valve exhaust valve. Piston. Crankcase. Connecting rod. Detonation. There is a limit, however, to the amount of compression and the degree of temperature rise that can be tolerated within an engine cylinder and still permit normal combustion. All fuels have critical limits of temperature and compression. Beyond this limit, they ignite spontaneously and burn with explosive violence. This instantaneous and explosive burning of the fuel-slash-air mixture or, more accurately, of the latter portion of the charge is called detonation. Detonation is the spontaneous combustion of the unburned charge ahead of the flame fronts after ignition of the charge. Figure 1043 During normal combustion, the flame fronts progress from the point of ignition across the cylinder. These flame fronts compress the gases ahead of them. At the same time, the gases are being compressed by the upward movement of the piston. If the total compression on the remaining unburned gases exceeds the critical point, detonation occurs. The explosive burning during detonation results in an extremely rapid pressure rise. This rapid pressure rise and the high instantaneous temperature, combined with the high turbulence generated, cause a scrubbing action on the cylinder and the piston. This can burn a hole completely through the piston. The critical point of detonation varies with the ratio of fuel to air in the mixture. Therefore, the detonation characteristic of the mixture can be controlled by varying the fuel slash air ratio. At high power output, combustion pressures and temperatures are higher than they are at lower medium power. Therefore, at high power, the fuel slash air ratio is made richer than is needed for good combustion at medium or low power output. This is done because, in general, a rich mixture does not detonate as readily as a lean mixture. Unless detonation is heavy, there is no flight deck evidence of its presence. Flight to medium detonation does not cause noticeable roughness, temperature increase, or loss of power. As a result, it can be present during takeoff and high power climb without being known to the flight crew. In fact, the effects of detonation are often not discovered until after teardown of the engine. When the engine is overhauled, however, the presence of severe detonation during its operation is indicated by dished piston heads, collapsed valve heads, broken ring lands, or eroded portions of valves, pistons, or cylinder heads. The basic protection from detonation is provided in the design of the engine carburetor setting, which automatically supplies the rich mixtures required for detonation suppression at high power, the rating limitations, which include the maximum operating temperatures, and selection of the correct grade of fuel. The design factors, cylinder cooling, magneto timing, mixture distribution, degree of supercharging, and carburetor setting are taken care of in the design and development of the engine and its method of installation in the aircraft. The remaining responsibility for prevention of detonation rests squarely in the hands of the ground and flight crews. They are responsible for observance of RPM and manifold pressure limits, proper use of supercharger and fuel mixture, and maintenance of suitable cylinder head and carburetor air temperature cat must be adhered to. Reignition. Reignition, as the name implies, means that combustion takes place within the cylinder before the time spark jumps across the spark plug terminals. This condition can often be traced to excessive carbon or other deposits that cause local hot spots. Detonation often leads to pre-ignition. However, pre-ignition may also be caused by high power operation on excessively lean mixtures. Pre-ignition is usually indicated in the flight deck by engine roughness, backfiring, and by a sudden increase in cylinder head temperature. Any area within the combustion chamber that becomes incandescent serves as an igniter in advance of normal timed ignition and causes combustion earlier than desired.
Reignition may be caused by an area roughened and heated by detonation erosion. A cracked valve or piston, or a broken spark plug insulator, may furnish a hot point that serves as a glow plug. Figure 1043. Detonation within a cylinder. 1030. The hot spot can be caused by deposits on the chamber surfaces resulting from the use of leaded fuels. Normal carbon deposits can also cause pre-ignition. Specifically, reignition is a condition similar to early timing of the spark. The charge in the cylinder is ignited before the required time for normal engine firing. However, do not confuse pre-ignition with the spark that occurs too early in the cycle. Pre-ignition is caused by a hot spot in the combustion chamber, not by incorrect ignition timing. The hot spot may be due to either an overheated cylinder or a defect within the cylinder. The most obvious method of correcting pre-ignition is to reduce the cylinder temperature. The immediate step is to retard the throttle. This reduces the amount of fuel charge and the amount of heat generated. If a supercharger is in use, reduce manifold pressure as much as possible to reduce the charge temperature. Following this, the mixture should be enriched, if possible, to lower combustion temperature. If the engine is at high power when pre-ignition occurs, retarding the throttle for a few seconds may provide enough cooling to chip off some of the lead or other deposit within the combustion chamber. These chipped off particles pass out through the exhaust. Backfiring. When the fuel slash air mixture does not contain enough fuel to consume all the oxygen, it is called a lean mixture. Conversely, a charge that contains more fuel than required is called a rich mixture. An extremely lean mixture either does not burn at all, or burns so slowly that combustion is not complete at the end of the exhaust stroke. The flame lingers in the cylinder and then ignites the contents in the intake manifold or the induction system when the intake valve opens. This causes an explosion known as backfiring, which can damage the carburetor and other parts of the induction system. Incorrect ignition timing, or faulty ignition wires, can cause the cylinder to fire at the wrong time, allowing the cylinder to fire when the intake valve is open, which can cause backfiring. A point worth stressing is that backfiring rarely involves the whole engine. Therefore, it is seldom the fault of the carburetor. In practically all cases, backfiring is limited to one or two cylinders. Usually, it is the result of faulty valve clearance setting, defective fuel injector nozzles, or other conditions that cause these cylinders to operate leaner than the engine as a whole. There can be no permanent cure until these defects are discovered and corrected. Because these backfiring cylinders fire intermittently and, therefore, run cool, they can be detected by the cold cylinder check. The cold cylinder check is discussed later in this chapter. In some instances, an engine backfires in the idle range, but operates satisfactorily at medium and high power settings. The most likely cause, in this case, is an excessively lean idle mixture. Proper adjustment of the idle fuel slash air mixture usually corrects this difficulty. After firing. After firing, sometimes called afterburning, often results when the fuel slash air mixture is too rich. Overly rich mixtures are also slow burning, therefore, charges of unburned fuel are present in the exhausted gases. Air from outside the exhaust stacks mixes with this unburned fuel that ignites. This causes an explosion in the exhaust system. After firing is perhaps more common, where long exhaust ducting retains greater amounts of unburned charges. As in the case of backfiring, the correction for after firing is the proper adjustment of the fuel slash air mixture. After firing can also be caused by cylinders that are not firing because of faulty spark plugs, defective fuel injection nozzles, or incorrect valve clearance. The unburned mixture from these dead cylinders passes into the exhaust system, where it ignites and burns. Unfortunately, the resultant torching or afterburning can easily be mistaken for evidence of a rich carburetor. Cylinders that are firing intermittently can cause a similar effect. Again, the malfunction can be remedied only by discovering the real cause and correcting the defect. Better intermittent cylinders can be located by the cold cylinder check. Factors affecting engine operation. Compression. To prevent loss of power, all openings to the cylinder must close and seal completely on the compression and power strokes. In this respect, there are three items in the proper operation of the cylinder that must be operating correctly for maximum efficiency. First, the piston rings must be in good condition to provide maximum sealing during the stroke of the piston. There must be no leakage between the piston and the walls of the combustion chamber. Second, the intake and exhaust valves must close tightly so that there is no loss of compression at these points. Third, and very important, the timing of the valves opening and closing must be such that highest efficiency is obtained when the engine is operating at its normal rated RPM. A failure at any of these points results in greatly reduced engine efficiency. Fuel metering. The induction system is the distribution and fuel metering part of the engine. Obviously, any defect in the induction system seriously affects engine operation. For best operation, 1031. Each cylinder of the engine must be provided with the proper fuel slash air mixture, usually metered by the carburetor. On some fuel injection engines, fuel is metered by the fuel injector flow divider and fuel injection nozzles. The relation between fuel slash air ratio and power is illustrated in figure 1044. 
Note that, as the fuel mixture is varied from lean to rich, the power output of the engine increases until it reaches a maximum. Beyond this point, the power output falls off as the mixture is further enriched. This is because the fuel mixture is now too rich to provide perfect combustion. Note that maximum engine power can be obtained by setting the carburetor for one point on the curve. In establishing the carburetor settings for an aircraft engine, the design engineers run a series of curves similar to the one shown. A curve is run for each of several engine speeds. If, for example, the idle speed is 600 RPM, the first curve might be run at this speed. Another curve might be run at 700 RPM, another at 800 RPM, and so on, in 100 RPM increments, up to takeoff RPM. The points of maximum power on the curves are then joined to obtain the best power curve of the engine for all speeds. This best power curve establishes the rich setting of the carburetor. In establishing the detailed engine requirements regarding carburetor setting, the fact that the cylinder head temperature varies with fuel-slash-air ratio must be considered. This variation is illustrated in the curve shown in figure 1045. Note that the cylinder head temperature is lower with the auto-lean setting than it is with the auto-rich mixture. This is exactly opposite. Common belief, but it is true. Furthermore, knowledge of this fact can be used to advantage by flight crews. If, during cruise, it becomes difficult to keep the cylinder head temperature within limits, the fuel-slash-air mixture may be leaned. High, auto-rich, power, auto-lean, break HP, low, lean fuel-slash-air mixture rich, high, auto-rich, power, auto-lean, break HP, low, lean fuel-slash-air mixture rich, figure 1045, variation in head temperature with fuel-slash-air mixture cruise power, how to get cooler operation, the desired cooling can then be obtained without going to auto rich with its costly waste of fuel. The curve shows only the variation in cylinder head temperature. For a given RPM, the power output of the engine is less with the best economy setting auto lean than with the best power mixture. The decrease in cylinder head temperature with a leaner mixture holds true only through the normal cruise range. At higher power settings, cylinder temperatures are higher with the leaner mixtures. The reason for this reversal hinges on the cooling ability of the engine. As higher powers are approached, a point is reached where the airflow around the cylinders do not provide sufficient cooling. At this point, a secondary cooling method must be used. This secondary cooling is done by enriching the fuel-slash-air mixture beyond the best power point. Although enriching the mixture to this extent results in a power loss, both power and economy must be sacrificed for engine cooling purposes. Many older, large, high-powered radial engines were influenced by the cooling requirements on fuel-slash-air mixture by effects of water injection. Figure 1046 shows a fuel-slash-air curve for a water injection engine. The dotted portion of the curve shows how the fuel-air mixture is leaned out during water injection. This leaning is possible because water, rather than extra fuel, is used as a cylinder coolant. These types of systems are not used on modern aircraft. This permits leaning out to approximately best power mixture without danger of overheating or detonation. This leaning out gives an increase in power. The water does not alter the combustion characteristics of the mixture. Fuel added to the auto-rich mixture in the power range during dry operation is Figure 1044 Power versus fuel slash air mixture curve 1032 High 